Before we get to Billy's idea on how to save baseball, Greg Cody, do you have any more reheated football takes that you think are going to be better on Tuesday than they were immediately <laughs> after the games on Sunday or on Monday? Because I, I have one. I saw Michael Irvin say on whatever the name of that show is with Skip Bayless. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not being disrespectful there. I don't know. that. Is it undisputed? Undisputed. Yes. Uh, he said that it is a fireable offense for the Ravens coaching staff to allow Travis Kelsey to complete, have 11 receptions on 11 targets. And I'm thinking they were trying to stop it. I'm thinking everyone's trying to stop that at all times, and it's not something that would appear to be stoppable given that Travis Kelsey always has 100 yards in every game that I'm watching, even though everyone knows you have to stop him. Evidently, the Ravens' tight ends can be stopped right. because I saw that happen Sunday. I have not seen in my lifetime since he's had Mahomes a Travis Kelsey that can be stopped. I actually agree with that because he's the one weapon consistently that Mahomes has had the entire season – and you know he's going to try to get the ball to Travis Kelsey. You can't let Travis Kelsey be the guy that beats you in that game. You can't. I, I understand, but he does and he did because he's the best <laughs> we've ever seen. And I'm I'm of the argument. Like, I understand how everyone arrives at these conclusions. Because Mike did it yesterday, and Mike was doing a game planning critique that a ton of people were doing. Why didn't Baltimore run the ball more? But I think of the Ravens as being an exceptionally run organization. I think of John Harbaugh as not only being a champion, but being pretty smart. And sometimes you trust your team to be better than the other guys at what they do. The Ravens take away the middle of the field and take away tight ends because of their linebackers and because of their safety. They couldn't take away that one. They had to take away that one, and it's a fireable offense because you lose – if you want to make it a fireable offense, but I haven't seen the coach that can stop Travis Kelsey. Mike, Mike McDonald is one of the hottest head coaching candidates because of the work that he's done as defensive coordinator to suggest that he should be fired because Travis Kelsey, arguably the greatest tight end of all time, had a great performance in the playoffs as television. That, that's what that is. It's debate television, but uh, Travis Kelsey hadn't been playing well entering yeah. these playoffs. He, he put up a... Uh, a three for 16 against the Cincinnati Bengals. Are you familiar with that defense's work this season? There's plenty of reason to look at Travis Kelsey and say, okay, he's one of the greatest of all time. Additionally, he appears to be declining because how can you not at that age when you consider where you've set the bar? But he hasn't had a good season by his standards. My point is, if you're the Ravens, and you could have been undefeated because you had fourth quarter leads in all the games you lost. Do you trust your guys to be good at the thing they've been excellent at or not? You change everything you do, you change it all because Travis Kelsey is coming into town and now, you, now you're going to have Patrick Mahomes beat you in some other way because you're going to what? Double and triple team Travis Kelsey? No, but then you trust your guys, but you also have to make slight adjustments depending on who it is that you're playing. Like for me, did. there's no I'm reason to game. guard Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Just throw him the ball and let's see what happens, okay? Because he might not catch it. I would put everyone on Travis, Kelsey, and Rice, and that's it, and force the other guys to beat me. And, and more so now than a few years ago. When, when Mahomes had Tyreek Hill, at least you could say, all right, they need to cover Tyreek. They, they need to worry more about Tyreek Hill. Now, if, if you're defending the, the, the Chiefs, you're not that worried about Pacheco. You're going to give him his 100-yard rushing. You're worried about Travis Kelsey, and without a great, as you say, without a great. Are you wide guys receiver. of the opinion that Harbaugh didn't understand that he needed to slow <laughs> Kelsey in that game? Right. That it snuck up well, on him, lost, like, yet, I mean. and yet like, didn't it's, do it's, it. I know, but but he didn't. That's the point. Like that, it's not crazy to say, hey, like our objective here is to stop Travis Kelsey from eating and have the other guys who can't catch the ball and drop it constantly beat us. And if Travis Kelsey beats us, we didn't execute the game plan, and this may have been our best shot at the Super Bowl, so there have to be changes. It's not crazy. They held the Chiefs to 17 points. You're hosting the AFC Championship game. That needs to be good enough. It, it needs to be good enough. That's, they held everyone fair. else yeah. in check, even Mahomes, especially in that second half. Mahomes made the one play that he had to to seal the game. The, this was a Ravens offense loss. Their game plan was let's have the best cover safety in the league against tight ends cover the best tight end in football. Yep. 
It's Kyle Hamilton, the only touchdown he's let up for a tight end was that one-handed catch that was a back shoulder throw that Kelsey made an incredible grab on, one of the two touchdowns that the Chiefs had. Kyle Hamilton was that piece. He was healthy, he was back in, and he just got the better one. My point, Stugatz, just so that the people understand what my point is, because I do understand when you're armed with the result, we are all experts. And I heard plenty of analysis, like uh, like Mike Ryan's, where people were saying everywhere, why didn't the Ravens run the ball more? It seems obvious to me in retrospect, having watched the game, that Spagnola's game plan was take away the tight ends and make Lamar Jackson beat you with his arm. They threw 40 times. But my question to the group here is the following. You think John Harbaugh is good at his job, yes? Yes. You think that organization is as good as any that there's been in football this century, yes? Yes. If they're not able to run the ball, and I told you yesterday that the Chiefs' defense over the last five weeks has been better at stopping the run than anybody, is it because John Harbaugh knows less about what he's doing there than we do? Or is it because the Chiefs might have taken something away that you're not understanding because when we're watching the game, we don't have the sophistication about what the adjustments have to be. All we've got is the criticism once you've got the result. Well, we have the stats that say the Ravens were twice as good at running the ball than the Chiefs were in that game. And that every time that they decided to hand the ball off or have Lamar Jackson carry, it was a really positive play for them outside of handing it to Justice Hill, who was terrible in pass protection as well. You can say they took away the the tight ends. Mark Andrews coming back from a lengthy injury, but this was the offense failing. This was the offense about to score at the one and fumbling at the one as A. Flowers tried to extend the ball. And I know Bill Belichick has famously said you don't reach for the touchdown at the one yard line because things like that can happen. The offense failed. The quarterback had a bad day. And the offensive coordinator, Munkin, had a really bad day. Agreed, agreed. My my point is, when the offense has a bad day, is it allowed to be because the defense did that to the offense, or does it always have to be their game plan? No, 100%. The defense has been incredible. Spags is one of the best defensive coordinators ever. Lamar Jackson is going to win a second MVP this season. They totally held him in check from an offense. There were a couple big-time breakdowns where Zay Flowers got behind people in ways that were a little shocking for a Spagnuolo defense, but th- this was Munkin failing. They, they, they botched the game plan against the Kansas City Chiefs. They got uncomfortable because they had to chase the game early on, and they got away from their game plan. It, w- it didn't make any sense watching it. I, I think Mike is right. This is a team, Dan. This is an offense that scored 38 points against the Lions, 50-plus against the Dolphins, scored 30-plus against San Francisco, had 37 against the L.A. Rams. Like This is a good offense that really didn't come to play. Did, just failed on Sunday. They did. They failed in a spectacular way. The Chiefs are in the Super Bowl because of their defense. Mahomes did not have a particularly good season by his standards, but any team with Mahomes on it is never going to get the credit maybe deserved on defense. The Chiefs had a great defense this season. Not a good one, a great one. Uh, elite. But top, that's top but my, three. But if, if you're going to say that, can you just parse for me the degrees on this, on how much, when you say, and you're right, Ravens offense failed. Whatever they were scheming did not work. 10 points, not enough. Chiefs score 17, you should be able to beat them. You guys are saying all the right things. I'm asking you to make the distinction between how much time you spend criticizing the game plan of people whose life's work is invested for many, many decades in making sure that they're prepared for that game. (laughs) And the easiest thing for us is to take the result afterward and say, you guys didn't know what you're doing. And so I'm asking, how much do I blame on the Ravens for their offensive failings? And how much do I say, well, McDuffie, And Snead are kind of amazing. The Dolphins tried to build what the Chiefs have. They said, look, we'll have Howard and Ramsey, and we'll make Chubb, Chris Jones, and ah, and and, ah. We can't do it. We don't have a way to recreate what the Chiefs did. What they do is obviously something that affected whatever Harbaugh's plan was, and I'm trusting going in, Harbaugh's got a plan. I think it can be both. I think you can give the Chiefs credit for a great defensive plan, and you can blame Lamar Jackson for once again having a really inferior game when they needed him to be at his best. But if you ask every coach in the NFL, every all 32 head coaches, 
How about you give up an average of 17 points a game on defense over the course of a season? Would you take that? Every one of them would say yes. When you hold the other team to 17 points, you're expected to win that game, and you better be prepared to score more than 10 points. And that's the story of this game. In in watching it, I kind of experienced like Lamar Jackson was holding on to the ball, trying to prove a point passing the ball, because there were several opportunities in that game where Lamar Jackson, arguably the greatest runner we've ever seen in that position, could have taken a 12-yard chunk. And he decided to hold the ball, and then the ensuing result was a coverage sack. They He just had a really bad game. And the offense had a game plan where they were chasing this game. If I tell you, the guy that scored the third most touchdowns in the sport, your starting running back, and granted they've had injuries there, is averaging six yards every time he touches the ball, but the only he only musters up 20 yards. three carries. With 20 yards, you're wondering what happened there. Surely this game got out of hand and they had to throw from behind and they were down three scores. That game was always within striking distance. They just started chasing the game in a very odd fashion for them. Lamar Jackson here almost reminds me, if you go cross-sport, to Giannis Antetokounmpo in his first couple of years winning MVP and then failing in the postseason where you're looking around and wondering, is this him coming up short? Is it the surrounding roster? Is it the, the scheme that Bud is putting out there as a coach at the time? Because you're looking around and wondering, how could this possibly flail in this way come the postseason when you're looking at this remarkable athlete doing things we haven't seen anyone else do at their position? So it's almost kind of similar, and you have to hope, if you're Lamar Jackson, that that your career starts to take that same arc. I thought that Lamar Jackson had a pretty telling quote before the game, and we didn't talk about it on this show, but he said of Patrick Mahomes, I hate playing him. He's 1-3 in in his career against Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes has seemingly stolen victory from the jaws of defeat against Lamar Jackson, and in watching that game, I think this guy's pressing against Patrick Mahomes, given their history, and he plays out of character. But, Mike, your point about not rushing the ball is probably the best point because this is by far the number one rushing team in the NFL. By far, Dan, that is a terrible job by John Harbaugh. You need to run the ball. Tony is trying to get my attention subliminally with his things to ponder file. We Mm, will get to that at some point. But Ron (laughs) McGill joins us as he has. Our longest standing guest, I believe, uh, certainly our longest standing regular guest, The Pride of a Lion, the book that he did with Greg Cody, continues to be a bestseller on some very obscure lists. You can get it wherever it is that you get your books. Uh, I want to start, though, Ron, with the Rhino Beetle this week because I was sent some video from a listener showing me that the Rhino Beetle can somehow lift about 850 times its weight. We have talked uh, very often about some of the things in the animal kingdom that have more power than you would expect. So give me an idea of how rare the strength of the Rhino Beetle is here and how many animals or insects of any kind you would put up against it in a in a test of strength. Well, it's incredibly powerful, of course, but a lot of invertebrates, you know, ants are a classic example of these invertebrates that can pick up so much more than their own weight. I mean, hundreds of times, I don't know if it's 800 times like the rhino beetle, I don't have the exact stat, but ants are notorious for their ability to to pick up some major, major weight. Uh, but the rhino beetle is, you know, it's a tank. It's a tank of, a, of an insect. Uh, it's got a huge, very, very hard ectoskeleton. Um, so it is a, is probably the Arnold Schwarzenegger of the uh, the uh, insect world. What else would you put in there outside of the insect world? Uh, things that might surprise us, animals who might surprise us with their strength. Look at leopards. Look at what a leopard could bring up a tree. Uh, I've seen a leopard bring up almost a full-grown, you know, not well, half-grown wildebeest up a tree. Something that weighs twice as much as the leopard. Literally grab it by its neck and climb up a tree with its legs, holding this thing in its mouth, dragging it up to the top of the tree. I've seen leopards drag things up into trees, and I'm going, this is unbelievable. So that, they're an incredibly powerful animal. Ron, uh, bullfighting is back in Mexico after oh, I saw that. after Jeez, being disallowed for two years, and Humane Society International refers to the bulls suffering from a protracted death tantamount to torture in the bullfighting arena. My question, why isn't there any sort of international advocacy for animals that reach the legal level like why isn't something like that illegal um 
it, it is in this country. You know, it all depends on the country's laws. And that's where, you know, you get into international law and you have to be very, very careful. I think countries are incredibly wary of someone else telling them what to do in their own home. The objective here is to try to just change the culture. And I mean, Mexico was on its way. It started to outlaw bullfighting in, in several of its states. Um, but there's still that old traditional culture. And unfortunately, I think that is going to have to wait until those generations die off. If you go to these bullfights, you'll see that the majority of the people there are, you know, fairly elderly in, in age as far as they're not the, the teenagers, the young people as much. Um, there are a lot of older people. And that generation just has to kind of, God, I hate to say it this way, die off. I mean, that mentality has to die off. Can you guys in video please put up for me this elephant video of a, an elephant with its trunk tearing down a tree? I know you've talked before about the strength of the elephant and yeah. the strength of the elephant's trunk, but this video, walk us through it, Ron. Yeah, elephants will knock down tree because they love to eat the bark. They love to eat the pulp, pulp of wood. Uh, they also love to eat the trees. So this elephant, and I've seen this also with actually trees bigger than that where a big bull will go in there and knock the whole thing down. And what it does is it provides itself with a buffet. Uh, they're incredibly intelligent animals. I've also seen them go and shake trees, you know, like the marula tree. It has a marula fruit on it. And they'll go up there and they'll shake these trees and all the fruits fall off. And it's wonderful. Uh, so, again, the elephant is one of the most intelligent animals on Earth. Incredibly powerful animal. So uh, they use that, that strength to their, their benefit, which in that case is to knock down a big smorgasbord. I'm going to put up here some elephant porn now because this oh, is, well, it's just elephants having sex, like really going at it. Uh, what what percentage of elephants, because this is difficult to do, it's a difficult act, uh, what percentage of elephants go through their entire life without ever having sex, Ron? I couldn't give you an exact number, Dan, but uh, I, I would think that the the majority are going to be males that don't have the sex because males will fight with each other to, to, uh, you know, to have the territory. So unless he's able to escape, do we have to keep showing this over and over? Uh, what you're not showing <laughs> yes, is actually, Ron. Yes, most, we do. The most, the most like incredible me. part of elephant oh. sex is actually the elephant penis itself. It's like a fire hose. That thing comes out and the elephant just mounts the, uh, the female and the penis does all the work. I mean, it, it swings around like a, a fire hose. You tie it, tie it to a fire hydrant, let it go. And that's what it looks like. It's just woo, 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 looking for that opening. And when it finds the opening, then it does all the work itself. But it's pretty incredible to watch. I mean, that thing is like a fifth appendage. It's pretty impressive. Well, you've told me before that the rhinos, it, all of this is painful, right? Because the animal that is on top is, is so heavy that it's going to hurt the other animal's back. Well, generally speaking, yes. And elephants, especially the bulls, are much bigger than the cows. They, generally speaking, have no more than usually about 30 seconds on the top of the female before she can no longer withstand his weight. Now, with rhinos, it's a little different because males and females are very similar in size. I've seen a, a female rhino carry a male on her back around for an hour at a time with the male ejaculating every two to five minutes without even doing any kind of pelvic thrusting because the vaginal walls of the female, uh, well, of course, it's got to be a female rhino, just kind of do all the work. The male just stays up there and all of a sudden every like, you know, two to five minutes, he does this shudder type thing. I don't think he's faking it for her. And that's when he's ejaculating and you'll see all this white, I can't believe I'm talking about this on this show because her kids are <laughs> Ron, you ever watch right. any videos it's of animals science. animals mating and, and take some notes, learn some tricks? Like, which animal, I guess, would humans most be able to learn from in that area? The best in well, that. I, I, right. I, think, I think there are a lot of animals that uh, people could learn from. First of all, just in the whole dating process. You know, a lot of people think with animals, it's just like the, you know, oh gosh, they're kids listening. You know, it's just a quickie type thing. It's not that way. Animals go through a very distinctive courtship process. The male is asking permission. The female is making the selection. Generally speaking, in Animal Kingdom, it's the female that runs the show. I know it's that way with a lot of us as well. But guys, when you realize that you need to let the female run that show, you'll be a lot happier. Um, and, and the fact is, you know, there's an orangutan. I'll never, we have an orangutan, had an orangutan, who habitually would perform oral sex on the females while using his fingers to stimulate her in other areas. I mean, this guy was a multitasker to the max. I watched him and go, guys, like, I don't know if they were watching films in the back or what was going on, but that guy was just, man, he was a god of reproduction. He was unbelievable. 
Speaking of reproduction, German scientists have turned to in vitro fertilization to help save the white rhino species. They finally successfully impregnated a, a rhino. What is your thought on turning to IVF to save an endangered species? I, I think it's absolutely something that needs to be uh, needs to be endorsed because at the end of the day, that's what we do it for people, um, you know, and I know there's going to be some religious zealots that say, oh, you know, this is not God's way. No, God gave us the intelligence to learn this, to help correct the bad things that we have done that have created these species becoming endangered and in fact extinct if we're not able to reverse that process. And what we're doing is we're basically creating a surrogate mother. You know, we do it in human beings, right? We, we do embryo transplants into another person to carry when a, when, a, when a woman cannot carry on her own to give her the, the child. Well, here we're doing you know, we've done it with a lot of other animals. We've taken zebras, endangered zebras, and put their embryos into horses, domestic horses that have given birth to a full-fledged endangered zebra. Uh, we've done that with endangered types of antelope and cattle. So to do this with rhinos is just such a an iconic animal that some people, you know, that there's some extremists like, oh, this is not, you know, not the natural way we shouldn't be doing this. No, we should be doing it because this is something we have to do to correct the the mistakes we've made in the past. It's knowledge that we have now to help save an endangered species. And um, I, I'm all for it. And I really am proud of the scientists that have dedicated so much time to make this possible. Ron, do animals have a capacity for romance? Absolutely, they do. Absolutely, they do. Uh, I've seen that in all kinds of animals where they come and bring presents. You know, they bring gifts uh, to the females, to Get her, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, giving jewelry to your wife. I mean, I've seen it over and over from birds to primates. These animals will court, they'll dance, romance. Listen, sometimes there's something no no more romantic than doing a wonderful dance with your, with your partner. And gosh, animals are the prime example of that. You look at some of the dances some of these animals do from, you know, lemurs to, 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 to birds, to birds of paradise, to these mannequins, all these mannequin birds, the, the dances they do. Look at that. Go look it up on the internet. You'll see these dances they do when they flash their wings, they go back and forth and they pat their feet. They do like a flamenco. They do all kinds of stuff. It's fantastic to watch. That's romance, man. I love a good dance before I have sex. But, Ron, you said something earlier and you're crazy, okay? Because if okay. I let my wife run the show, you know what I'm not having? Sex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good one. I, I'm oh, sorry, Stu, guys. Uh, but let me tell you. <laughs> don't be sorry. It's trust amazing. me. Trust me. When you're having sex, Stu, guys, it's because your wife allows it. She's running it. She may make you think you're running the show, but at the end of the day, it's her call, brother. Put it on the poll, please. Do the do animals have the capacity for romance, yes or no? And do you want to imagine Stugat seducing anyone? Uh, Tony, what do you no have? Pants what do you have for Ron McGill? Dear God. Uh, Ron, all animal tongues are different. And we were talking about the elephants earlier. In Thailand, I fed elephants at part of a, a sanctuary for elephants, and their tongues are incredibly slimy. Why is it that yeah. their tongue is incredibly slimy, but then other tongues are different, maybe more coarse? They use them for different things. Like, what's the difference between animal tongues and the species? Well, it depends what they're eating. And I think what's happening there is, you know, it's like when you see food that you really, really like, you're getting excited, you start to salivate. So these elephants are probably, you know, getting very excited that they're going to get these treats that people like you are giving them there. So their saliva starts running quite a bit more. Uh, and that makes the, the, the tongue a lot more slimy. Um, and they're also... Elephants can't really stick their tongue way out. It, it kind of protrudes a little bit, but it's not like a giraffe that comes out like, you know, 16 inches. Um, so by constantly being in the mouth with all that saliva, the tongue appears to be more slimy when it's really, it's not really producing the saliva. It's just, you know, keeping it on its surface because it's always in its mouth. Ron, there's a video of an eagle, a bald eagle, carrying what appears to be a, a mid-sized deer. At least yeah, it's a, a chamois. Yeah, at least a, ju a juvenile. Right. And, and it made me wonder, what is the strongest bird in terms of being able to carry X times their own it's weight? It's always the harpy. He always takes the harpy oh, eagle. Yeah. But look at that. Dan has learned. It is the harpy eagle. Really? It's the most powerful bird of prey on earth. That thing can carry you know, a small child away. I feel like the harpy eagle is your answer for any eagle question. <laughs> Overrated no, eagle. No, it's not. Yeah. It's not. It's not. Because if you want to go, you know, with the eagle that, uh, you know, is not the brightest eagle in the world, it's not going to be the harpy eagle. Okay.
It's the bald eagle. Uh, the harpy eagle is the most impressive animal in the animal kingdom, according to Ron McGill, of wow. all the animals. It's a, not it, just... it's, a pretty, it, it, it's a pretty impressive animal, Dan. It's, a, it's an incredible bird. I mean, you can go and, uh, you know, that's the golden eagle right there. So it's the golden eagle that got a chamois. That's the chamois that you see right there. I saw that same video. It's pretty impressive. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's very impressive. What's but you'll the, see those golden eagles. They'll get full-grown foxes. They'll the, take down and fly away with full-grown foxes. What is the so biggest? Go! What is the biggest eagle that uh, the biggest by animal that a